I'm Roslyn Carita, and this is History and Heritage. And today, I'm standing in front of Tanglewood House. I'm at 1601 Madison Street. You drive by here all the time, but I'll bet you don't know this story. Now, we had a show last time about the history of one of these log cabins, but today, we're gonna concentrate on learning how a log cabin that was at Neely's Bend in Nashville made its way here to Tanglewood House in Clarksville. Stay with us. Hi, this is The Restore. My name is Catherine Norbeck Daly and I'm the manager here at the Habitat for Humanity Restore. Everything we sell in here is donated. All of the proceeds go to benefit the Habitat for Humanity homes. We take windows, doors, building supplies, cabinets, household goods, and we will pick up. The Restore is located in downtown Clarksville at 408 Madison Street, across from Madison Street United Methodist Church. The phone number is 645-4242. Call us to schedule your next donation pickup. Welcome back. We are just about to take a look at a cabin that really didn't start out here. It started out in Nashville. So I'm looking at this cabin and it looks to me like it was always here. Tell us, how did, how did it get here to Tanglewood House? It's a very interesting story and it begins with a lady that had this business years ago, Phyla Hall. Okay, and I think Phyla Hall is a part of Clarksville history herself. She is. She is very much. She's woven into our fabric just like any any other part of Clarksville. She uh, loved the Pioneer's tenacity. She has a real love for the log cabins. She had someone that she knew, Mutt Williams. Now, I don't know where he's from, if he lives here locally or if he's from Nashville. Mm -hmm. He called her one day and said, there's a log cabin they're about to, to take down in, in the Nashville area. Are you interested? So she, she said yes. <laughs> so the cabin uh, was slated to be demolished because uh, they were putting in a road. Uh, it was covered with clapboard and therefore people didn't know its, its significance at the time. She paid all of $5 for the cabin. And you know, anybody that knows Phyla knows that she was really a businesswoman. So that doesn't surprise me. Not at me. all. Not at all. But the other piece of that, besides being a good businesswoman, mm. I mean, she really cared about these cabins yes. and saving history. Right. So she, she made it happen. And not, not everybody can do that because she had a lot of obstacles. Right. Uh, but she made it happen. She had the resources to do this. And when you look at the construction of the cabin, it wasn't put back just willy-nilly, just uh, haphazardly. She made sure that the logs were numbered and put back just like uh, like the old log cabin sets we used to have. Right. And the cabin is so well made, uh, you can tell that this is not the rounded, rough log cabins that you, right. logs that that you, you see. see that, yeah. This has been planed down again using the, the Sam was using the tools that his okay. father had. Okay, and, and we talked about those tools in our, in our last show. The tools that were used were tools that were actually owned by Sam, who built its father, William Neely. We, and he brought them just post-Revolutionary War. Probably, yes, he either brought them down. It's hard to imagine the kind of tools that he had being brought down, so he might have bought them once he arrived, mm -hmm. but we don't know. But you can see the actual, the, the ax marks in the wood. Yes, you can. Very closely at that. That is amazing. I mean, just to be able to put your hand on something that you knew was done by hand right. in the late 1780s. Right, right. And of course, they used, uh, this was called chinking, the material that was in between. This is uh, cement today, but back in the day, they used mud, horse hair, rocks. Anything that anything. would make a, make a, a padded a bond, up. Yeah, yeah. Keep it. Uh, the Indians were so good with shooting arrows that they could fire between the logs and hit the person inside the cabin. So 
they want to be sure that they had something, a filler in, in there. But this is the virgin timber that came from Neely's Bend, and it's cedar, which means it's going to last for a long, long time. And it has, and it looks great. So, okay, this was standing. It was at Neely's Bend. Right. Um, do we know anything about how it came to disrepair or how it became clapboarded over so nobody could see it? Several generations of the Spear family lived in the cabin, mm -hmm. and at some point, like it, so many times it does, it came uh, no longer to be in the Spear family. And then, of course, uh, somebody putting the, you can tell the nails where they had the, mm -hmm. the clapboard over it. And people ah, just okay. simply forgot, you know, that we, we forget a lot of our right. history. And well, and, you know, when we see this in the context, context of being pioneer era, then we say, oh, this is safe and wonderful. But once you have electricity and a right. stove, then this is not quite so inviting. You know, right. I, I can't imagine that people would choose to live here if they had an option that was more right. commodious. Right. So it was sort of forgotten until the time that they were about to demolish it. So Fala accepted the responsibility of bringing it here. It was a uh, very well documented uh, event. It, uh, the Lee Chronicle covered it. Oh, really? Uh, P.M. Terrell, who wrote the book, uh, the descendant who wrote the book on it, came and visited the cabin, but they were just enclosing the dog trot when uh, the Lee, Lee Chronicle came over and took a lot of photographs of Phyla with Mutt Williams and her crew that was reconstructing mm -hmm. it back to its, uh, to its you know, uh, condition that it is today. But you can tell, the things that had to be added, the guttering, the roofing right. had to be changed. These stones are original to the... Okay, so the chimney, they took it apart stone by stone right. and put it back. And you had mentioned um, that they, it wasn't willy-nilly, that they really did make a plan. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to walk around here and have you show us. Okay. The uh, there is one that actually still has the number on it, so that we can see the number. Right. Right. I think there's at least two logs, but this one's easiest to to look at. Okay. Um, and again, we are right on Madison Street. So the 85 that we see right up here was actually a number that they put on it when they were trans moving it from Neely's Bend to Clarksville. Right, so it would be in the exact location when it was reconstructed here. So I, I really think there was quite a plan. Obviously these were professionals who yes. did the moving. Yes. Phyla didn't take any chances on this being damaged. No. And it looks like there might be another number there's, un underneath it. There's several red markings. What right. they mean, I'm not exactly sure, but yes, those markings, and they're over here as well. So everything was, was marked so that it could be put exactly back. Because when you look at how the ends come together, they had to be, or they right. were gonna have to do some cutting themselves. Yeah, they so they, they're fitted exactly the way right. they should. And it's almost like, I guess it's called dovetailing. Yes. And these are very large windows. Not I wouldn't anticipate that a log cabin would have had large windows. No, a file enlarged the windows, obviously for light purposes inside. But of course, when you're building a cabin and you're using it also as a protection against Indians, you don't want a large window. So uh, she, she told me that that window up there would have been the size of this window here. Of course, this window was not in the house. Uh, right. This was added later. But that was much larger and in the front too than what would have originally been there. But she also enclosed in the dog trot. That would have been an open breezeway. Remember, cabins at the time were only used for sleeping in inclement weather. If you, uh, if you were awake, it was daylight, you were working. <laughs> and you worked outside. And if it was hot in the summertime, you slept outside. So really having just one room in one room was enough. Right. And when Phyla purchased this, I mean, she didn't purchase it just to display it. As we said, Phyla was a businesswoman. Right. This location has always been an event venue, right. and people come here to get married, to have celebrations, mm -hmm. to have big parties. And so she worked on these cabins so they would accommodate guests. Right. And well, today, this lower area is the groom's room. So if you're getting married and you want to stay in Neely's cabin, you can come here and, and be in the groom's room. If you're the guy, the girl doesn't has her own cabin over here. But just to be able to say that you stayed in the Neely cabin, pretty neat. Yeah. Yes. Well, we're going to go inside the cabin now. So stay with us. We'll be right back and we'll show you inside Neely's cabin.
Will you become a guardian angel? The Humane Society has been saving lives and helping families since 1968. We are an independently operated nonprofit organization, and the strength of our programs rely solely on donations and grants. Your donation will allow us to save animals from the local county shelter, as well as provide low-cost spay, neuter vouchers, and more. All of our programs are geared toward providing families with options that prevent them from surrendering personal or found pets, which might otherwise be euthanized at a shelter. Please be a guardian angel today. Manor Cafe was founded because one man felt called by God to feed the poor. Hello, my name is Kenny York. I'm founder and director of Manor Cafe Ministries. Hunger is a reality here in Montgomery County. Numbers say that one in six adults suffer from food instability. That means they don't know where the next meal is coming from or they may go to bed hungry. And one in four children, that means children in our own backyards are going to bed hungry. Those numbers aren't going away. In fact, they continue to get worse and worse. One of the ways Mana Cafe combats these issues is through a food pantry, where food boxes containing 30 to 50 pounds of food are distributed to single moms, seniors, military and other families, and anyone else in need. And with a team of dedicated volunteers, Mana Cafe has provided food to thousands of people in the Clarksville, Montgomery County area. Because Mana Cafe is also committed to going where the need exists, the mobile cafe program consists of taking hot, appetizing meals to various outdoor locations throughout the community multiple times per week. Guests receive not only a meal, but also a sense of community and Christian fellowship. Through the mobile pantry program, Mana Cafe periodically distributes thousands of pounds of groceries at various locations throughout the city. Every day, Mana Cafe sends out trucks to pick up food donated by local businesses and food drives and through partnerships with national organizations such as Second Harvest Food Bank, Feed the Children, and Feeding America First. Mana Cafe also offers services to Clarksville families such as a free medical clinic and counseling with an on-site chaplain. Here at Manor, it's not just about the food. It's about restoring dignity. It's about loving our folks. It's about telling them that they matter while we're trying to minister to their basic needs, which is hunger. We are now inside the cabin and what we're standing under is what really was what they call a dog trot mm -hmm. and I think that's sort of self-explanatory but tell us anyway. So we're for ventilation. This was a breezeway because you had such openness and so forth. Having an opening here and an opening here, the breeze would come through and it's certainly a natural way of air okay, conditioning. Okay, so really a cross ventilation kind right. of thing and it was open kind of a Kind of a patio with a yes, roof? Yes, absolutely. Okay. They used it that way. If there, it was raining and they wanted to spin, they could sit under here and, and do the spinning, prepare food out here, whatever. Mm -hmm. It was just like a covered porch. Okay. And so Phyla, when she moved it, closed it in so that this could be something she could utilize right. at the event venue. And one of the first things that you mm. notice when you come in here, you know, we, we saw the cedar on the outside. But this is on the inside that hasn't suffered the rain and sleet. Elements. And so this is what it really would have looked like when yes, they lived here 200 rich years ago. Beautiful cedar color. Beautiful. And again, you can see the actual yes. strikes where it was where it was made. So this is the size. This is exactly the way it was, except right. now it's closed in, right. and uh, it is air conditioned and heated. Right. <laughs> Thankfully. Yes. So tell us. People lived on both sides. 
who lived in this cabin? Okay. Samuel uh, Neely would have lived in this cabin with his family. And of course, there were only two rooms, and you think, well, that's awfully small. He had a large family. What, what, was, what could they do with that? Well, you only stayed in the cabin at night for sleeping. You stayed in the cabin for protection, mm -hmm. and you stayed in the cabin in case it was bad weather outside. Otherwise, you were outside working in the field. Mm -hmm. You were outside, especially on a hot day, because mm -hmm. it was cooler outside. So you were not sitting in front of the television or no. working on your computer. No. You were outdoors, and so this even though this has managed to last all this time, people didn't live in it every second no. of the day. No, they did not. And uh, there's a question on whether the floor was dirt or whether it was wood. I imagine it probably started out with wood, but Samuel Neely living in the cabin his entire life, mm -hmm. we know 30 plus years, and then his son, George III, lived in it, and three or four more generations of Spears lived in this cabin, probably they added the wood floor. Mm -hmm. So it probably started dust. dirt and then wood. Right, right. So when Phyla moved this, um, she hired a professional company and had this set up where she wanted it. Right. And this is not the only cabin on the place. No. But this one, is this the oldest? Uh, what, what more uniquenesses do we have about this cabin? The, well, the cabins that, that are in the back are from the Clarksville area. They're probably about the same time period mm -hmm. uh, that, that uh, this one is. Uh, Clarksville, uh, we were talking about Mansfield Station, and I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but Casper Mansker came with John Montgomery, Montgomery County, mm -hmm. uh, to the Clarksville area. He talks in his journal about being at the, the rivers, the red, where it comes from to right. the Orioto, which it was called then. So we know that those two men were in Clarksville together. And of course, we know the early settlements of Clarksville, but on what is uh, now Riverside Drive mm -hmm. were two cabins back then called Water Street, and really wasn't even a street. Mm -hmm. We're talking about all the, all the trees that you see on Riverside Drive today would not exist back at that time. People were using them for housing, for fuel, right. they, for their flat boats, they were gone. Right. And so Riverside Drive was built later, but there was the slope going down into the river, the, the two cabins that are in the back, Philo told me, came from that area. Okay. And they belong to the John Hamill Poston family. Okay, let's take a look into the two rooms that are on the sides of the dog trot. Okay. So let's just kind of go in here and of course again now uh, when you see a, a pool table you, you go now wait a minute when was this built but remember this is now an event center but it still is the original cabin and I see this what was a wonderful fireplace they now have a wood stove in front of it right. but but this is the original I'm not sure if that is, but on I'm the inside, you, but the outside is. The outside okay, is. Okay. But I will tell you a story about the fireplace. When uh, when Phyla brought the cabin to Clarksville, they located two Indian arrowheads in the logs. Okay, and I think we have some pictures of we those. We have some pictures of those. And she mounted it in a frame with other arrowheads in a frame above this mantelpiece here. Okay. So what other in, artifacts? Uh, I think I, that's the only thing she mentioned to me. She, uh, you know, she she loved the arrowheads and, and uh, I've seen them and they're still with her. But every piece of history that she could keep with the cabin, you know, she kept with, you know, the way it was reconstructed and so right. forth. But uh, just a beautiful story that even after the family felt safe and living in the cabin, right. there were still arrows being shot at it. And, and that really, I mean, that, that brings it, home. yeah, it does, because we just kind of tend to think of, oh, yeah. But when you, see, when you see the arrows that were in the cabin wood, that is right. scary. But can you imagine a time when you, you need to go out and work in your field, but you're not really sure if you can go out and work in your field because you might just get killed going out to your That's field. Right. Oh. So you have to look and be careful, and, and we just take it for granted that right. we can easily just walk out of our houses today with no danger, and they had, it was life and death to them. Uh, let's take a look at the other room and again there's only two rooms two right. rooms and the dog trot and now that this is used as an event center uh, this is w the place that's used for the groom and so you'll see other accoutrements in here that will kind of throw you off as far as time <laughs> <laughs> don't think they had these <laughs> right and there are two at least two bathrooms in in this facility now uh, but this area uh, is smaller and this is really quite smaller. And, but we do have a couple of artifacts up here. Uh, are those 
I wouldn't think so. They're okay. too, they look too well made. Okay. Uh, but it gives you an idea of some of the tools that might have been used. Right. Uh, we know that in the uh, inventory of William Neely's uh, estate at his death, talked about wedges and the plangers that they used right. to uh, make the, the logs straight walls instead of rounded. Right. Of course, this would have never been here. Uh, the bathrooms also take up a large portion of right. this closet here of what would have been, this would have been the exact same size as okay. the other one. Okay, and that makes sense. Yes. All right. Yes. Well, do you think that we could take a look at the other two cabins Let's that, do that are on premises? Sure. All right. I want to start this next segment with an expression that people have heard often but may not know the truth behind it. Okay. The expression is, God or Lord willing, and if the creeks don't rise. I've now, heard it. We're not talking about a body of water. We're talking about if the Indian Creek Indians don't rise. Now that is, that's news See? to me. I, I, I had always assumed that it was literally the creek. Right. Okay, it's so not it's, about the water rising at all. It's about the Creek Indians rising. The Native American Creeks. Right. Okay. Right. Now these cabins that we have here, as far as I know, were never under attack by Indians. These were taken from uh, Riverside Drive and relocated here, much like the other cabin, mm -hmm. by Phyla Hall, pieced together with some changes. She did add a mansard roof. If you don't know, Phyla's husband was German. He was a tobacconist in Clarksville. And because of the German influence, mm -hmm. they made a mansard roof out of it instead of what you would see as a pitched roof. So this is the bride's cabin uh, that is used by the bride in case they want to use this venue right here right. For, for a wedding. So how old, do, when do you think, I mean, is this the same time period or maybe a little later? Probably the same time period. Uh, John Hamill Poston came into area, uh, Clarksville area uh, in the very beginning. Now, did Poston build this? Yes. Okay. These are okay. his cabins. Oh, okay, okay. That were located, according to Fowler Hall, on Riverside Drive, which is now Water Street. And so he owned that land? Yes, he owned eventually something like 2,000 acres, had 200 slaves, and eventually, I guess realizing that the, the Cumberland floods quite often, mm -hmm. decided that the location of these cabins was not such a great idea. So he built a large three-story brick house where B.F. Goodrich is located today. Is The house, of course, no longer stands. Okay. But when B.F. Goodrich bought the property, they used that old house as their office until they tore it down. And uh, Poston's uh, property was known as Poston Springs. Uh, had the largest spring in the Clarksville area. It's capped off now. I'm not even sure where the spring okay. is, but that's where they would have gotten their water. So he moved for, for several reasons, leaving these behind because of the flooding of the river okay. and because he wanted to be closer to the spring. Okay. So the cabins, both of them, were on Riverside, Riverside Drive. Drive until when? What, when until, did they? Until uh, acquired them, and I'm assuming probably the same time period okay. that she brought the other cabin and here. That makes sense to create the venue right. for events. Right. So 1968? Somewhere in that time period. That, okay. Yeah. But these, uh, clearly the roof has is, been changed. Yeah, right. the, the early settlers would have never envisioned anything like that. Right. Of course, this is electrified and it's been uh, added gutters and, and so forth. But you get the idea again of, uh, but look at, look at the size of the, the cedar logs with this. Much smaller. Much smaller. Uh, some people would say uh, log cabins, some of them, the walls were made of like three logs. You say, well, people are awfully short. No, when we're talking about virgin timber, a log might be three feet in diameter when cut. Right. So three feet, three feet, three feet. Right. Just a different way to measure it. Right. Much like right. when you measure a horse. You know, right, by hands. Right. But you can tell here if, if he only used three logs, then nobody could have walked in there. But right. these were much smaller. Uh, logs that were used in the building of this this cabin and there's also one over here too. okay and so really even just with what you've told us clearly there are real differences between the way this was built as opposed to the one at Neely's Bend which really was designed where people were going to be there I mean right. this looks much more temporary almost it does uh just by its construction it's not as to me by the by my eye and i'm no expert at all but it doesn't look as well constructed or maybe maybe there's been some replacements you see some darker wood higher up right maybe they had to replace them i don't know but you do see the the axe marks on the lower logs and this was a two-story i mean this probably had a I loft of think some it kind it probably had uh it was probably a loft 
probably didn't have the windows up there, I'm right. thinking. But it did have the pitched roof, just a straight line roof. Right, so really a different design. Yes. Well, yes. let's take a look at the other one okay. at, that, that was also belonged to him, and it's really located just behind us where um, in this venue would be where the bride, where the ceremony actually would take right. place. So here at the other end is the other cabin. Right. And it looks like it's smaller, perhaps. Right, right. A, again, a different design. Right. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about John uh, Hamill uh, posted. Uh, his daughter, Adeline, married a man from Robertson County named John Couts. And Poston was so impressed with him that he gave him the building on the public square called the Poston Building. Okay, and, and that's unique, and we'll do that story another time, but, but it has what you call the ghost ad? Go, is, ghost signs. Ghost, ghost signs. signs. So we'll talk about that one another time. But, but that is, you have so much knowledge about the history of Clarksville. But so this one approximately built at the same time? Yes. yes. Seven, late 1780-ish? Probably. Uh, again, Clarksville, we talk about uh, Casper Mansker coming mm -hmm. in with, mm -hmm. uh, with Montgomery in 1755. Okay. So absolutely. Uh, around probably 1770s, 1780s. And do we, I, I know you said that Phyla, being the good businesswoman she was, only paid $5 for the other cabin. Right. Do we have any idea what she paid for these? She never told me, but she may have gotten them for free. And no one knows. <laughs> she, was, she was that good, but yeah. uh, she never mentioned to me how much she, right. she might have paid for them. But she did buy yes. them, and I, I think that there are, you know, this is old history, and I think some people have different thoughts on it, but she told you that she bought them. Yes. And, you know, Phyla saved these. Yes. Even though she made some changes on them, she saved them. Huge, big piece of Clarksville history. So let's walk over here to this one just a little bit closer and um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about some other cabins in Clarksville that you uh, that you know about. Okay, as I mentioned before, we know that uh, Ma Green's, which was a boarding house. Ma Green's, okay. And uh, it's still on 7th Street. It's, a, it's I think it's painted either yellow or green today, but Ma okay. Green and her husband ran a boarding house on, on 7th Street, and businessmen would come into town, stay there, and the table was humongous. It was a very long table, and they had the best food. Everybody remembers how good the food was at Ma now, Green's. Now, what, what time period are we talking oh, about? Oh, let's see, her, her uh, granddaughter was my best friend. So okay, so th this is history that's recent compared to this. 60s, 1960s. Okay, yeah. and so that existed then? Oh, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. That house was belonged to someone before Ma Green bought it. Okay, but it, it was built in 1780-ish? Uh, the log cabin, probably. Okay. The log cabin is still exposed. You can see that when you're looking at it. Then all the rest of this that's been added on the second story section, okay. that was added onto the cabin. Now tell us where that is again in Clarksville. So I'm driving down Clarksville. Where is that? You're going down Madison Street and you're headed almost to the old Clarksville High School. Okay. 7th Avenue turns left off of Madison Street if you're going that direction. Okay. Okay, it is the first or second house there on the right. All right and it's for sale currently. So if you want some history, <laughs> there it is. There it is. Okay, so we have that one, and then... We talked about the Cooper Howell House. Right, and where uh, is that located? That is at the end of 2nd Street and Madison Street. It's the two-story greenhouse. It's been unoccupied since the tornado. Right. And it's been recently purchased by Dr. Warner, who uh, owns a lot of property downtown, and they're planning to restore it. And that will be something wonderful for us to follow. They are very yes. committed yes. to bringing yes. this back to life and really making it a wonderful piece of Clarksville's history. So once again, I want to thank you. No one has the knowledge that you do, Carolyn. This is marvelous. And this is Clarksville's history. It's your history and your heritage.
Hi, this is The Restore. My name is Catherine Norbeck Daly, and I'm the manager here at the Habitat for Humanity Restore. Everything we sell in here is donated. All of the proceeds go to benefit the Habitat for Humanity homes. We take windows, doors, building supplies, cabinets, household goods, and we will pick up. The Restore is located in downtown Clarksville at 408 Madison Street, across from Madison Street United Methodist Church. The phone number is 645-4242. Call us to schedule your next donation pickup.